Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Leland Metheny is a clinical instructor at UH Cleveland Medical Center, Division of Hematology Oncology. He completed his undergraduate medical school and residency training here at Case Western Reserve University by way of a combined research internal medicine pathway. Dr. Metheny's Early research aimed to uncover the immunomodulatory effect of human multipotent adult progenitor stem cells and mesenchymal stromal cells in mice models with acute graft-versus host disease. His preliminary work laid the foundation for his translational research in novel stem cell transport, transplantation. In 2014, he was the recipient of the Department of Medicine Research Fellow Award. As an honorary K-12 Paul Calabrese Clinical Oncology Research Program Scholar, Dr. Matheny is actively involved in a clinical trial aimed at measuring the rate of primary engraftment failure, engraftment kinetics, and immune reconstitution between patients undergoing intraosseous transplants and those undergoing double umbilical cord transplants. As I, was, as I was once an intern seeking his fellow expertise on the Ratanoff team, I am now honored to introduce a decorated researcher, stellar clinician, and devoted teacher, Dr. Leland Metheny. Thank you very much. I guess that makes me sound much more important than I am, I guess. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about novel approaches to allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, uh, the overview is I'm going to talk a little bit about why we do stem cell transplant in the first place, um, a little bit background on the conditioning regimens and the graft sources that we utilize, and then specifically I'm going to talk about novel techniques that we've developed here at UH um, involving novel conditioning regimens cellular therapies, graft manipulation, and immunologic therapies, particularly post-transplant. And then we'll have questions um, afterwards. I might actually stop um, in the middle um, to see if um, you have any questions in regards to allogeneic transplant as well. The learning objectives will be to understand the rationale for allogeneic transplant. Um, hopefully you'll be able to characterize the graft sources for allogeneic transplant and highlight the UH-specific innovations around allogeneic transplant. So why do we do allogeneic transplant in the first place? So um, allogeneic transplant is um, the reconstitution of a hematopoietic system um, in a donor from a recipient. And it is a mechanism to provide high-dose chemotherapy um, to a patient, basically rescuing the patient from high-dose chemotherapy with a hematopoietic graft. And two, it's a mechanism for providing a graft-versus-leukemia or graft-versus-tumor effect with a new immune system. The reasons to transplant a patient are varied, but may include a previously failed therapy. For instance, a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma who has failed um, standard chemotherapy and then an autotransplant, which is rescuing the patient with their own hematopoietic stem cells, may need an allogeneic transplant for cure. Second, high-risk disease. Patients with um, high-risk acute leukemia, such as AML and ALL, who have high-risk genetic features, they do not do well with standard chemotherapy, so they need to be um, uh, treated with allogeneic transplant. And then inborn errors of hematopoiesis. Um, things like Fanconi's anemia, um, sickle cell anemia, and thalassemia ha have all been cured utilizing allogeneic stem cell transplant. And um, this is basically a schematic on what occurs um, for an allogeneic transplant. See, at the top there is a donor, and at the bottom there is a patient. The patient has been identified with, let's say, a high-risk hematopoietic malignancy. I just learned how to do, like, um, these features, so I'm kind of excited about it. So, first of all, we HLA match the patient and the donor. Um, it makes sense that um, you can't just transplant anyone's bone marrow or hematopoietic system into another patient. You need to HLA match them appropriately. Um, and once that's done and we have an appropriate HLA match, um, we can proceed to um, the donor getting their stem cells collected, either through um, bone marrow aspiration, where we take the patient or the, the donor to the OR and take a liter to two liters of bone marrow out of their um, hip, or we give the donor Nupagen, which mobilizes their hematopoietic stem cells to the periphery. We put a line in their neck, and then we stuck, suck out their stem cells 
um, that way. Um, in regards to the patient, the patient undergoes um, high-intensity um, chemotherapy to try to eradicate or reduce the amount of tumor well, called conditioning regimen. Once the patient has completed conditioning, um, the new hematopoietic stem cells are introduced, usually IV, into the patient. And then over a period of 30 days, the new um, hematopoietic system is reconstituted, um, and immune recovery happens um, up to one year or maybe even two years after that. During this time frame, this critical period for um, problems such as craft versus disease, acute or chronic, and then a very um, high risk of an infection um, from bacterial, fungal, and virus, viral sources. Ah, this is my, sorry. Um, right here with the built, rebuilding of the immune system with the donor T cells is where the graft versus leukemia um, effect um, also takes place. So I'll talk a little bit about conditioning regimens. Um, they can, in essence, be divided by graft sources. We won't go into that. Um, but they can also be um, divided by intensity. And so myeloblative um, conditioning regimen basically expects the patient to not recover their own hematopoiesis. Non-myeloblative conditioning means that the patient really does not require stem cell um, support after the conditioning regimen. And anything in between is called reduced intensity. Um, conditioning regimens can also be separated into the disease that they're being treated um, by. For instance, you might give a lot of rituxan to someone who's getting conditioning regimens for CLL. We won't necessarily go into that, but the important thing is that you recognize there are um, intensities to the conditioning regimen. Oops, one back. So <clears throat> the intensity of the preparative regimen, there, you can understand there are multiple ways to give chemotherapy, and there's multiple chemotherapies to be given. And the conditioning regimen um, goals include removal or reduction of the host immune response prior to the, um, the induction of another graft, and also re removal or reduction of malignancy. Certain chemotherapies are more myelosuppressive. Um, certain chemotherapies are more immunosuppressive. Um, and <clears throat> the lower intensity regimens are associated with lower mortality in the peritransplant period, but also um, if you use your common sense, it makes sense that if you give less chemotherapy, you're going to have higher risk of relapse because it's not going to be able to remove um, or reduce the amount of malignancy in the patient. Whereas if you have someone with a higher intensity regimen, you're going to have a higher um, rate of mortality in the peritransplant period because of chemotherapeutic effects as well as higher immunosuppression. But you're going to have a lower risk of relapse because you're going to have more removal or reduction of tumor burden. The graft sources in allogeneic transplantation include a matched-related donor, such as a, a brother or sister, which usually requires a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 HLA match. A matched unrelated donor, if the patient doesn't have a matched related donor, um, that we find on the uh, National Merit Donor Registry, and that also needs to be a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 HLA match. We can also transplant patients with umbilical cord. When a baby is born, their umbilical cord um, is usually um, discarded, but there are a lot of hematopoietic stem cells within the cord, and um, those can be collected um, and stored and refrigerated. The great thing about the umbilical cord is that it, because it is a um, non-adult um, immune system, it can allow for greater HLA variability. And so we only need to match at, at most four out of six um, um, HLA uh, loci. And then there's also something called a haploidentical um, donor, which is a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, um, a child who is only half identically matched, so a 5 out of 10. That um, type of transplant requires um, a different type of conditioning regimen um, with basically a T-cell depletion um, either before the transplant or after the transplant with post-transplant um, um, cytoxin. So in general, um, typically a match-related donor yields the best outcomes in regards to treatment-related mortality, graft versus host disease, and overall survival. So the match-related donor is the Cadillac graft source, if you can get it. 
in general, an umbilical cord transplants tend to have longer engraftment time, um, meaning the time from the um, bottoming out of the white blood cell count to the reconstitution of um, the immune system. And that is because, on average, a umbilical cord blood has one-tenth of the stem cells that um, an adult donor has. And therefore, because of the longer engraftment times, you have a longer time with um, low white blood count, low platelets, low hemoglobin. You have a greater treatment-related mortality with umbilical cord. Um, however, retrospective data suggests that you get a greater graft versus leukemia effect and have lower graft versus host disease. And um, haploidentical transplants are the newest type of transplant, and that is basically increasing the donor pool for a lot of our patients, especially in minority communities. One of the consequences besides the graft versus leukemia effect is the graft versus host disease um, risk after a transplant. And basically, the conditioning regimen um, causes a lot of um, damage to um, organs such as the liver, the gut, skin. This damage um, causes basically um, cells to die, and some of these cells um, cause inflammation, and it, the donor um, antigen-presenting cell presents parts of these cells to the new immune system. The new immune system recognizes these parts as foreign and then basically attacks the organ of, of choice. The most common places to be attacked by graft versus disease include the skin, the liver, and the gut, and this can be life-threatening. It is important to understand that graft versus disease comes in a number of grades. So Grade one of the skin is a slight rash, whereas grade four could be anything of whole skin sloughing off your entire body. Whereas grade one, um, graft versus host disease of the GI tract may be a little nausea and vomiting or diarrhea, where grade four could be five liters of diarrhea out per day. Um, grade five or grade four, um, graft versus host disease is generally um, associated with a poor prognosis um, and um, death within one year after transplant. And so this is a picture of chronic graft versus disease of the tongue. Um, this is, I mean, if you can Google graft versus disease, you'll find a whole bunch of horrible pictures, but I tried to find something that's um, palatable. Um, and that's graph, uh, acute graft versus disease of the skin on the back of a patient. So pretty bad looking stuff. So some generalizations in regards to transplant. For young patients with high-risk malignancies, if available, a match-related donor is the graft source of choice. And the preferred conditioning regimen is a myeloablative regimen. The reason being, um, a match-related donor have less risk as graft versus host disease and treatment-related mortality. Younger patients can tolerate higher doses of chemotherapy. And higher doses of chemotherapy are associated with lower relapse. So before I go on to the novel approaches to allogeneic stem cell transplant, I just want to make sure if anyone has any questions in regards to allogeneic transplant, why we do it, um, the processes we go through, um, we can answer questions now. All right. So I'm going to outline, <clears throat> this, this is an outline of basically the novel approaches um, around transplant. We're going to talk about a novel conditioning regimen that um, is a phase one trial here, and um, Dr. Polo Kami is the PI on it. And it's going to kind of answer the question, how can we improve efficacy of the conditioning regimen without increasing the treatment-related mortality? We're going to talk about cellular support of hematopoietic stem cells, and if other stem cells can support engraftment of the hematopoietic stem cell. We're going to talk about um, graft manipulation in regards to ex vivo expanded cord blood grafts and how can that improve rates of engraftment. And then we're also going to talk about the post-transplant therapy. Um, how can we redu reduce or eliminate minimal residual disease um, in uh, certain hematopoietic malignancies after transplant? So question, what is the easiest, oldest, single myeloablative conditioning regimen? Picture. Jacob, what is it? Radiation, right? Nuclear bomb. So, so conditioning um, therapy with radiation is very old. Total body radiation um, basically is considered myeloablative between the doses of 12 gray and 16 gray, and it's been done for many, many years. 
Um, total body radiation um, toxicity can be reduced through the use of fractionation and or hyperfractionation, just meaning you give dosages over a period of days and those dosages are cumulative. You don't give one dose at, in one day. And usually TBI is com combined with uh, cyclophosphamide, cetirabine, etoposide, um, melphalan, and busulfan, um, in part. Um, however, TBI itself is associated with a number of high-risk acute and late side effects, including organ failure immediately post-transplant and secondary malignancies as well. <clears throat> so the clinical question is, um, um, sorry, so basically in a randomized trial of patients with AML in um, complete remission one, roughly 16 grays was superior to 12 grays um, in preventing relapse after transplant. However, this was offset by the treatment-related mortality um, in, um, in the 15.75-grade um, cohort. So the question would be, can we increase the um, grays um, without increasing the treatment-related side effects? Um, and so Dr. Kami and Dr. Mansour of the Department of um, uh, Radiology, um, uh, Radiation Oncology, developed this trial of total marrow radiation called TMI. Um, and basically, this is combined with fudarabine and busulfan as a conditioning regimen. And the idea is, instead of irradiating the whole body, you map out the patient, um, you map out their bone marrow, and you can deliver a targeted dose of radiation to their bone marrow itself, which actually sounds quite interesting and cool. Um, so because it is a phase one trial, it is um, offered to patients who regularly would not be available um, or would not have the option of allogeneic transplant. And the goal and the aim is to determine what is the highest dose of targeted marrow radiation a patient can um, tolerate. So we, um, in this um, study, we'll accept match-related donors and unrelated donors, and they can't have received radiation in the, in the past. And so it will be given BID um, through days um, T minus 10 um, to T minus 7, and just for your own edification, when transplanters speak of T minus 10, it means 10 days before the transplant or 10 days before the infusion of cells. And um, it'll start at a, uh, a dose of three gray and escalate 1.5 until 12 and then one afterwards. So the progress at this time is um, IRB approved and IND approved by the FDA. We've treated five patients um, at this time, the first patient um, actually developed significant graft disease on 3 gray. So um, we started again at 3 gray and then have finally worked up for 4.5. Everyone since that first patient has tolerated the, the reg regimen quite well and actually gone out of the hospital pretty quickly. So the treatment-related mortality has been, um, besides the first patient, fairly low. However, all patients have relapsed. Um, after uh, their transplant, suggesting that 4.5 is not the uh, um, appropriate um, dosage level and that we need to escalate farther. Um, and we are actually planning to, to escalate to 18 grades, which, as you recall, is actually higher than the, um, um, the myeloblative dose that I talked about earlier. <clears throat> so um, moving on from conditioning regimens to cellular therapies, um, Allogeneic stem cell transplant is itself thought to be a cellular therapy. However, there is a potential for manufactured or novel cells to be co-infused with the hematopoietic stem cells, thereby maybe um, improving engraftment, um, reducing the risk of graft versus host disease or infection or relapse cells. So some cells that have been used include mesenchymal stromal cells, the natural killer cells of the immune system, virus-specific T cells, um, and CAR T cells, um, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, um, are all potential candidates to be co-infused with, um, with the graft source. As a little side, um, um, we have an expertise at CASE and UH of mesenchymal stromal cells. Um, Dr. Lazarus was one of the pioneers of this, of this unique um, cell. It was originally um, discovered in 1976 by Dr. Fredrickson, pop popularized by Dr. Kaplan, um, over at CASE, um, and they can be derived from a number of tissues, including the adipose, placental, umbilical cord tissue, and many, many more, lung, et cetera, bone marrow. Um, they 
have been identified by, the, by their ability to develop plastic adherent fibroblasts and culture. That's one of their characteristics. Um, they have a number of um, uh, cellular features on the outside. They're HLA2 positive, um, CD40, um, CD80, and CD8 negative. Sorry, HLA2 negative, and CD105 and CD73 and CD90 positive. Um, they have the capacity, because they're called mesenchymal, to develop into adipose um, chondrocytes and adipocytes in, in vitro. Um, interestingly enough, they do not provoke um, an immunologic reaction um, if they're transplanted, and they tend not to interfere with activated T cells. Um, so potentially, um, you could give mesenchymal stromal cells from one person to anyone and not need to HLA match them. And MSCs have been shown to modulate both innate and adaptive immune responses and support bone marrow growth. So um, how have MSCs been used in um, transplant? Um, so like I said, they have been proposed to enhance bone marrow um, engraftment. They have been um, uh, utilized in a clinical trial performed at our institution by Dr. Lazarus um, with autologous M um, MSCs, and that has been proven to be safe. They've actually been co-transplanted. Um, um, parental ex vivo expanded MSCs with an umbilical cord have been infused into pediatric patients um, and demonstrated safety, but the, um, the cohort um, size was small, so there's, there was no statistical dif difference between um, uh, a historical cohort. Um, so our the clinical question, is there an opportunity to enhance hematopoietic stem cell engraftment with MSCs? Um, and when I talk about engraftment, I talk about um, this um, definition. So neutrophil engraftment is defined by absolute neutrophil count over 500 times three days, and a platelet engraftment is 20,000 um, platelets times three days without transfusion. So as you will recall, I talked about umbilical cord transplants previously having a longer time to engraftment, um, and that's because the um, stem cell dose is roughly one-tenth um, one-tenth of the um, dose of an adult donor. And the good, um, the umbilical cord transplants increase patient access to curative transplant, and they're associated with less graft versus disease. The bad, umbilical cord transplants have longer time to neutrophil and platelet engraftment. Neutrophil engraftment is around 25 days. Platelet engraftment can go on beyond 40 days, leading to increased treatment-related mortality. The cost of one umbilical cord trans uh, on one umbilical cord unit is forty thousand dollars, and in the United States, a standard transplant utilizing umbilical cords for an adult patient is two. So right off the bat, you have a fairly significant cost um, with this type of transplant. So some of the mechanisms, and I digress to a type of infusion because my the clinical trial that I pre I'm going to present involves both mesenchymal stromal cells and intraosseous um, transplantation. So one of the ways in Europe that they've tried to reduce um, the utilization of umbilical cords is to infuse one graft intraosseously. And as you can see from this um, diagram, Frassoni <clears throat> and his colleagues in Italy um, basically um, infused um, one umbilical cord unit in the ileum in, in a number of patients. And the methods basically is the patient is at the bedside sedated and um, a jam sheeting needle is inserted into the ileum either bilaterally or unilaterally, and the umbilical cord is broken up into four aliquots and infused in different spots. It's basically um, been shown to be very safe in that setting, and there were no side effects. One of the interesting um, things from this trial is that um, patients with suboptimal dosages of um, umbilical cords had um, um, uh, an average neutrophil engraftment time of 21 days, and patients with um, appropriate um, uh, stem cell dosage, the, um, the neutrophil engraftment was 23 days, um, and in nine patients um, with over three times 10 to the seventh total nucleate cells, which is um, a very nice dose of stem cells, they recovered at 22 days. So potentially you could use one unit of umbilical cord and introduce it intraosseously um, and get the same engraftment time as if you used two, okay, when you infuse it IV. Okay, um, so that actually has been done fairly significantly. Um, the Europeans have performed over 100 intraosseous transplants with umbilical cords, and compared with the um, uh, double umbilical cord transplants, which are introduced IV, they seem to have um, 
improved engraftment time and less graft versus disease um, compared to historical controls. And even the idea of one quarter or two in the United States has been questioned. Um, there was a paper published by Wagner um, in, in pediatric population just using um, randomizing patients to um, one quarter or two, and it turns out that the single cord had, had less graft versus host disease and better platelet recovery. So is one cord translatable to the adult population? So taking a, a step forward, from both the MSCs and the intraosseous transplant, can we combine those um, two modalities and improve the engraftment time even faster? And so um, the um, study that Dr. DeLima and I came up with is a co-transplantation of umbilical cord blood cells and mesenchymal stromal cells um, infused intraosseously. Um, and can that result in improved engraftment, less graft versus disease, and a lower cost to our patients? So the first step to any um, to any clinical trial, um, um, you kind of want to go back to the mouse model and see if it's safe or if it actually works. So I had the um, uh, pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Ken Cook and then Dr. Alex Wong, and we developed this um, mouse model to try to test our theory. Um, we have a nod skin mouse model, which is basically a mouse with a, a very limited immune system. It's given a sub sublethal dose of radiation. And then there's six cohorts of mice of five each, excuse me, <clears throat> um, that are going to be infused with human cells, either IV umbilical cord blood cells, IV umbilical cord blood cells with IV MSCs, intraosseous um, umbilical cord cells, which are actually introduced into to the tibia of the mouse, which is very hard to do. Um, IO umbilical cord cells with IO MSCs, and then various combinations, either IV or IO. Um, and they're introduced bo in both tibia, um, and so the right tibia was taken in flow, flow cytometry, and the left tibia was sent to histology when they were taken down after six weeks. And basically what I was able to demonstrate in this, in, um, this figure, um, both graphically and numerically, is that in the mouse, um, cohort that got intraosseous um, infusion of MSCs and umbilical cord blood, keep in mind these are both human cells in a mouse model, um, that the IO co-infusion of umbilical cord blood cells and um, MSCs demonstrated superior myeloid engraftment, which is represented by CD45, um, superior uh, T-cell engraftment, which is represented by CD3, and superior B-cell engraftment, which is represented by CD19. And so we came up with a schema um, for a clinical trial based on our um, mouse model. So we will have 10 um, to 12 patients with high-risk malignancies that um, are not necessarily candidates for transplant otherwise. We will um, evaluate a non-related, non-HLA-matched MSC donor and um, ex vivo expand those MSCs and then freeze them. We will give these patients um, that have high risk malignancies reduced intensity conditioning. And then on T0, we will infuse the umbilical cord cells with the unrelated MSCs. We will demonstrate feasibility from the study um, by monitoring for primary engraftment failure. Um, engraftment time and toxicity. And just to let you know, primary engraftment failure is determined if, if after 42 days after transplant, the patient does not reconstitute the new immune system, that's termed engraftment failure. So I'm, I'm happy to say that we already um, have approval by the um, um, IRB. Um, the FDA has approved us. We have an IND. And we actually enrolled two patients um, and actually transplanted them. So um, this is all done at the bedside. Um, the infusions um, went off without a hitch. Of course, these patients were very high risk. One patient had an haploidentical transplant from her sister and relapsed within 100 days after transplant. She, um, she actually um, had umbilical cord engraftment at day 14 um, of 97% donor, which is excellent. However, shortly after that, her disease came back and she succumbed to her AML. And then we had a, a myelofibrosis patient um, who had end-stage myelofibrosis. 
She had a huge spleen. Um, these patients usually are not candidates for any type of transplant um, because of the high risk. Um, she actually showed 97% engraftment at around day 32. However, um, around that time she developed um, uh, pneumonia and became septic and passed away from that. So we are now enrolling another patient, a high-risk malignancy patient, um, and um, going forward with our trial. So moving on from cellular therapies that combine um, MSCs with um, umbilical cord blood in, um, at the time of transplant, um, I will be talking about graft manipulation of the graft before transplant. So currently there are a number of graft manipulation studies that involve umbilical cord cells. There's a fucosylation study of umbilical cord cells, and um, there was a paper published in 2012 by um, Popat. Um, basically the um, glycans on the surface of the hematopoietic stem cell, um, uh, fucose can be added on. Um, it tends to um, have the hematopoietic stem cell traffic to the bone marrow niche faster. Um, there have been a number of studies introducing pro prostaglandin E2 into the umbilical cord graft, causing the, the umbilical cord to differentiate and expand ex vivo. Um, and then there's a number of studies involving engineered niche ligands, basically, again, um, focusing on getting the umbilical cord to the bone marrow niche. Um, once again, we have an expertise with MSCs, and Dr. DeLima um, <clears throat> um, pioneered this at um, MD Anderson before he came here. Um, so MSCs have been shown to support hematopoietic stem cell growth and differentiation. So um, why not find an opportunity to enhance engraftment by expanding one cord with MSCs? So that's going, that was actually um, the, uh, the question in a, new, um, a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, by Dr. Zulima a couple years ago, I think four years ago. And basically, 31 patients with high-risk um, hematopoietic malignancies without a match-related donor or unrelated donor, therefore that their only option was really cord, um, were to undergo this um, expanded um, cord study. So one cord is given, um, not manipulated at all. One cord is actually um, uh, grown um, two weeks beforehand with MSCs and a little bit of stem cell factor, TPO, uh, thromboquitin, um, GCSF or Neupagen, and a FOOT3 ligand, and ex expanded. Um, and then they, this is a phase one study, so um, they looked for engraftment time, um, GVHD, overall survival in this study. And um, the results are on the, the right side. Um, this is a non-randomized prospective trial. Um, the expansion of the manipulated umbilical cord graft um, demonstrated the total nucleated cell um, dose was increased by a factor of 12, um, which is great because, like I said, um, a graft source from the umbilical cord is one-tenth of an adult. So basically you, you expanded it up to an adult um, um, level of stem cell dose. And the CD34, which is a, um, a more accurate description of, of stem cells, was increased by um, a factor of 30. So pretty nice, nice, nice dosages of stem cells. Um, the overall survival at one year was 30%. Um, that's um, not bad for a phase one clinical trial in patients that don't have any other options. Um, and um, I'll talk about the phase um, three randomized trial that's ongoing, but as you can see from the, the graph, um, let's see, um, the black line is um, historical controls. Um, this is neutrophil engraftment, and you can see that in, in this study um, that the expanded graft with co-infused with the unexpanded graft engrafted much faster, um, about ten, 7 to 10 days faster neutrophil engraftment, and a little bit slower platelet engraftment, which is, tends to be the case, um, engrafted about 5 days faster than the historical controls. So currently ongoing, we have um, the Phase 3 version of that study. Um, it's called MISO 1Z12. Um, patients with hem hematologic malignancies that don't have a matched related donor or unrelated donor are randomized to um, controls. One, two unmanipulated cords, which are, is the standard of care in the United States, or, like in the previous study, an ex vivo expanded cord and a one unmanipulated cord. And, of course, the outcomes include engraftment, treatment-related mortality, graft-versus-host disease, um, PFF, um, 
disease-free survival and overall survival. Um, and that study is currently ongoing. We have over 100 patients enrolled. It's actually um, uh, a national study on which um, uh, Dr. DeLima is the national PI and I, Dr. Lazarus is the local PI. Um, moving on to post-transplant therapies, um, and this is a new um, kind of thought process in allogeneic transplant. There really is no post-transplant therapy um, for many malignancies after transplant. The transplant's it. Um, but now we have um, better tolerated drugs, um, immunologic therapies that seem to be um, targeted that may provide some benefit after transplant and um, reduce um, recurrence. Um, so there's a number of, of antibodies effective in um, hematopoietic malignancies, lenotumumab, um, which brings together the T cell and the CD19 positive, hopefully malignant um, ALL cell, um, the inotuzumab, which is an anti-CD22 antibody um, bound to colecheomycin, um, which causes DNA breakage, um, which is, um, if it hasn't been recently approved, it will, will do very soon, um, based on the New England Journal of Medicine article that was published this year. And of course, we all know rituximab, vitamin R, and an anti-CD antibody, which is used, a lot, used against lymphoma. So are the, are, is there a role for these um, post-transplant um, to prevent relapse? <clears throat> so let me digress and talk about um, the need. Um, so for acute uh, lymphocytic or lymphoblastic leukemia, um, minimal residual disease is actually a very poor prognostic factor before transplant, as you um, might surmise. The rates of relapse are as high as 80% for patients who are transplanted with minimal residual disease um, for ALL. There's also a high risk of relapse in patients who um, undergo reduced intensity conditioning for ALL, and um, rates of relapse upwards of 50% in those patients. Also, those patients who are transplanted in their third or second CR have a high risk of relapse. So the high risk of relapse in these patients possibly could be prevented or addressed by effective post-transplant interventions that would eradicate minimal residual disease and not jeopardize the actual new immune system. And so um, based on the, um, the study in the New England Journal of Medicine by Kotarjian, um, inotuzumab um, seems like a very nice candidate for post-transplant therapy. Um, for patients um, undergoing um, treatment for ALL. So it's bound to colecheomycin, which is actually um, found in chalk pits in Texas, a bacteria. Um, that's why it's called caliche. Um, and it basically is a very potent, it's toxic to all cells, um, and it breaks DNA. Um, so you don't want this floating around in your body, basically. You want it bound to something. Um, and um, it, it has been shown to be fairly effective um, and a randomized study um, that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine article, um, I, like I said, um, this year. Um, for patients who have uh, relapsed ALL, um, and it, it has been used as an F effort to salvage them, to take them to allo transplant. Um, and basically, uh, patients who achieved a CR um, without minimal residual disease um, with inotuzumab had an overall survival of 42%, which is actually quite excellent for relapsed ALL. Um, however, it should be noted with a caveat that this therapy is not without side effects. Uh, many of our antibody bound, um, uh, antibodies bound to um, highly toxic chemotherapies um, cause significant either graft dysfunction, um, reduction in the white blood cell count or platelet count, or VOD, um, VOD, um, venoocclusive disease or sinusoidal obstructive syndrome is a very life-threatening potential side effect of transplant, and basically it causes overt liver failure, um, which you can't live without your liver. And the um, risk of that with um, inotuzumab is about 20%, um, so fairly high. So because of the risk of SOS, pre-transplant therapy um, with standard doses of inotuzumab may increase the treatment-related mortality around transplant as SOS usually call it, um, occurs in the first 30 days of transplant. So 
is there an opportunity to eliminate minimal residual disease or mitigate the risk of relapse um, and limit toxicity in the post-transplant setting with lower doses of Ida-tuzumab? Um, so basically um, what we um, thought is can we uh, introduce a lower dose of Ida-tuzumab post-transplant after the 30 days where SOS would occur um, and increase survival with, for these patients? So um, we actually have a study that um, is going through the um, pipeline. Um, it's case 1916. It's a phase 1-2 trial. It's supported by Pfizer. And um, basically, patients who, um, like I described previously, have minimal residual disease um, before transplant, or they have high risk of relapse, um, either in second or third CR, or they're getting reduced intensity conditioning. Um, can be enrolled. Um, after day 40, um, and the patient has demonstrated a complete remission by bone marrow biopsy, they can be in, um, enrolled um, and get low doses of isotunumab. Now, keep in mind, this is a phase one trial, so there's going to be a, a dose escalation um, with this um, therapy, um, and they'll get it up to um, four cycles every 21 days. And, of course, we'll look for um, treatment-related side effects, determine the dose-limiting toxicity and ma um, maximum tolerated dose. And then we will expand, once that has been determined, to a phase one um, cohort. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, we'll also look at um, outcomes such as overall survival, grass versus host disease. So that's it. Um, so I hope I've given you some um, information on how, why we perform allogeneic transplants, um, kind of the graph sources, um, how we choose conditioning regimens, and a little bit about what the novel techniques that we're utilizing here, um, and um, hopefully pick your interest so you can uh, rotate on the bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant. Okay. You allow residents to rotate the bone marrow transplant? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah. So what happens if someone does an engraft? I think I've seen him on the ID console service. But, uh, you probably have. So if someone has primary engraftment failure, either a number of things happen. One, they, um, they engraft back or their own immune system comes back. Um, so that's autologous recovery. That's not necessarily a problem because you have an immune system. Now, if a patient doesn't engraft um, after day 42, it's called primary engraftment failure, like I say. They're at increased risk for infections, and that's probably why you see them. So usually in that, in that setting, if they have a match-related or unrelated donor, um, we might try to uh, get another graft, or if they have cells that were saved um, or that were frozen from the donor, we can give those. In various circumstances, we might just ask for a cord to come because um, the cord is actually the fastest thing to get to our doorstep if we don't have... Um, a graph source readily available in the freezer. So these, I mean, these uh, consents are fairly um, thick. Um, uh, just, just, uh, for the VA, Dr. Spada sort of asked about the challenges of consenting people for the highly technical complex protocols. Just so so in general, um, all of our <laughs> clinical trials around transplant are um, handled by our nurse coordinators. Um, our nurse coordinators are not only um, logistical um, magicians, but they're also educators. Um, and so they will sit with the patient, um, and I will sit with the patient if I'm the PI or if the patient's mine, and we spend basically half a day going through not only what transplant means, but also what the clinical trial means. So it's, it's fairly um, intense. Um, so yeah. there's, fair, uh, there's a lot of education around transplant. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. So patients with, uh, you know, you always want 
the right amount of graft versus host disease. You don't want too much or too little. It's like um, the opposite side of the, or like the opposite sides of the coin. Um, so patients with a little bit of graft versus host disease do benefit from a graft versus leukemia effect. Too much graft versus host disease, they die from the graft versus host disease. Yeah. How many um, stem cell transplants do we do a year at Seidman? So um, basically, we do upwards of a hundred. Um, maybe 110 this year, um, but roughly half of them are allogeneic and half of them are autologous. So, uh, perhaps some hope for ALL, which is a bad disease. Yeah. It is. So, I was going to include, I didn't know if I'd have this much time, but uh, it's better to get out early than late. But there's actually a very um, comparable um, trial undergone by Seattle Genetics. It's literally the same protocol. That's how kind of we got the idea. But um, there is a post-transplant um, antibody bound to Colletia mycin um, antibody. Um, it's uh, CD33 instead of CD22. Um, and you can give that after um, transplant for patients who have high risk for relapse for AML. Yeah. Awesome. Good.